as usual, I want to remind people that we're just here to learn about the patterns of the plants and just sort of get an idea about how to peer inside of them. Sometimes it can take a long time to learn which plant um, comes from which family. I know that there's still a number that I don't know. Um, and that could be because we haven't seen enough parts of it yet. We don't have enough information. And that's sort of the fun of being a nature journaler is having these mysteries, um, even if we don't know the answers to them yet. So this is just to make plants a bit more familiar to us and feel like they're a bit more our friends. So with that, I will start my slideshow. It just might take me a bit of a second to get everything good. Um, sorry about this. And then here we go. Um, Plant Families in Our Foods and Nature Journaling Series 2. And we're happy to have you all with us today. Um, so to start with, we will start by having our two minutes to draw the plant that we see in front of us. You don't have to get every detail perfect, just sketch what you see. And after two minutes, we will have an extra minute to add any words, descriptions, questions, observations, and numbers to our pictures. So we'll start and thank you. So we'll take about one more minute. That another 10 seconds. And there's our two minutes. Now let's take one more minute where we can add any words, describing words, questions, observations, and numbers to our pictures. another 10 seconds. And there's our minute. All right, are folks ready for the second one? Yeah, 
Okay, here we go. Here's our second one. And we will take our two minutes to draw what we see. Again, don't worry about getting every perfect thing. Just do what you can. about 15 more seconds. And there's our two minutes. So now you can take one more minute to add any words or numbers to our pictures, starting now. About another 10 seconds. And there's our minute. Is everyone ready for the last picture? Yeah? Okay, I see, I see people nodding. Here we go. Here's our last one before we meet the family of the day that I think everybody already knows because I gave it away <laughs> for two minutes, let's draw.
All right, another 10 seconds. And there's our two minutes. Now, one final minute so we can add any words and numbers to our pictures. About another 10 seconds. And there's our minute. All right. Are you all ready to meet the family of the day? Yeah? Who thinks they know what it is? Show of hands. Yeah? I guess we'll find out. Here we go. Welcome to the Gord family. And I could not resist a pun. They're quite gorgeous. <laughs> um, and the name of our family of the day is Cucurbitaceae, which is named for Gord in Latin, Cucurbita. So this is our lovely family today. Oh, I apologize for the traffic in the background. I don't know of any other old names for this family. Might have had one, but I don't know of it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's any other old names. This one seems pretty straightforward. Are there any questions so far before, um, before I go on to a bit more of our features of our family for today? Any questions? No, no questions so far? Actually, I had a question. I didn't write down the color of the first blossom. Um, can you tell me what it is? Oh, yes. Um, I thought of it as kind of a white color. Here, we can go back. Yeah, this one's a white one. This one, I believe, is a relative, not the same species, but a relative of the bitter melon. I think it has another name, but I cannot remember the other name. Um, but yeah, it is related to purpose of the gourds to get animals to eat them and distribute the seeds? That's a good question, Michelle. My answer to that is I'm not totally sure, especially because some of the gourds, at least to us, are poisonous. So some of the wild ones are. So that is a really, really good question. Or to provide nourishing environment as they decay. See, these are the questions that I love. And these are the questions I'd recommend put, making a why web about so that you can explore all of the different possibilities. And then as you watch them, then you can sort of begin to, to eliminate possibilities. So ooh, how do tendrils work? We'll get into that. I don't know what makes them all springy either. Hi, Jack. And then this one, I'm not sure exactly what kind of a squash it is. Might be a zucchini, um, but this is one of the garden squashes. And then, I'm sorry. And then this one is a crookneck squash in case people were wondering uh, which ones were which. And then, oh, sorry. And then this one right here is a butternut squash. Well, they're young and cute and not turning that, that golden color just yet. <laughs> really adorable. So usually I, I always start out with this with our um, basic flower anatomy, just because I like to start from a really basic place. So we have our stem that our flower sits upon. We have our sepals, those lovely little, almost leafy bits, not quite leafy bits that sit right beneath the rest of the flower, as opposed to further down the stem. 
we have our petals, we have our stamens that make pollen and our pistils that make seeds. And the way I remember that is PSSP. Pistols make seeds, stamens make pollen. But you might notice that our family of the day is a little bit different. What do you all see that's different about this diagram? You can call out the answer. What's different than usual? Where the ovary is? Where the ovary is, yeah. The inferior. Yep. yep. And um, the last time we, we met, um, we talked a little bit about inferior ovaries. Um, to have a superior ovary, okay, so where everything is here with sepal, petal, et cetera, et cetera, if the ovary is inferior, then it forms here beneath the sepals. If it's superior, it forms either sort of with everything else around it or above it, um, usually above it. When it's around it, it's kind of weird and doesn't have really. Um, oh, the first flower we drew, Susanna. Okay, I'll go right back to it in just a second. Um, it was called, um, I can't remember the exact name, but I know that it is a relative of bitter melon, um, but I can't remember the exact name. So yep, um, you're right, Anne, that the ovary is in a different place. What else do you all notice that's kind of different about this diagram today? There are two flowers. Usually I only draw one. And that's because this particular family specializes in having separate flowers for separate parts. We have what some can call male flowers or staminate flowers and female flowers or what we call pistolate flowers. So the stamens are over here on one flower and the pistils over here on another. We call these unisexual flowers. So that's, what look, that's what's a little bit different today about this family. We have, we have five sepals on each of the flowers. We have our five petals. But in this case, a lot of the time, the petals are kind of fused together, sometimes further up than others, sometimes closer to the bottom. Um, but they're fused together. And so when the petals are, are all fused, then we call that a corolla. Corolla is kind of just a fancy term for saying all the petals or petals when they kind of get put into one. You'll find a lot of these um, will have kind of funnel shaped flowers, I guess you could say, although in different um, varying degrees of openness, I guess. Um, but we have our pistil here on one plant and our stamens here on the other. Now these can take a lot of different forms. So while this is just one example of them, the forms can be kind of weird looking. So if you feel, if you look at some of the, um, either the stamens or the pistils, then you might notice that they're a bit weird. I'm kind of excited to hear how people will describe them <laughs> in their weird shapes. Um, and it can be from three to five. For some reason, it's not consistent across the board um, on these. So there's that. Here, I'll show a quick example from this one. You can see that the centers look a little bit different from each other. Let's see? If you had to guess, which one do you think this one is, male or female? You can unmute if you like. Female. Female. Why female? I want to like your question, Deborah. We're going to get to it in a second. These are a bit harder to tell, but a lot of times with the stamens, they'll kind of all gather together so that they almost make a pillar of pollen. And you can see little drifts of pollen here. So this one is actually male. And then this one here with the weird look is female. It looks a bit different from my drawing, which makes it hard, but they all have different shapes. So that's something to note that I wanted us to note today. So we have these that are kind of different from each other. So there are a lot of characteristics. You don't have to write all of this down. In fact, I recommend that you can sort of add notes here um, and make it so that your drawings are kind of diagrams to add these notes to, just to make it a little easier so you don't have to write down a huge wall of text. But like Jack mentioned, they do have tendrils, these plants. They're vining. A lot of them will be vining in habit. Um, the tendrils 
at least what I've noticed, help them climb. Although it'd be fun to see if there's other purposes for these tendrils as well. Um, the leaves have lobes and or they're palmate, but they're usually simple. You don't find the leaves um, being pennate leaves or compound leaves, the way some of our other families have been. They're usually all in one, although some of them can be more lobed than others. Um, they're separate male flowers and female flowers, so mostly unisexual. And to answer Deborah's question, usually both the male and the female flowers are present on the same plant. And we'll talk about that in a second. The word for that is monoecious. There are five sepals, sometimes no sepals, just to be different, I suppose. Um, petals are fused together to the five-lobed corolla. They're often radi radially symmetrical. So picture like a sea star. Things aren't kind of weird and disproportionate. Although I guess it also depends on which angle they're facing when they bloom. The stamens, three to five of them, oftentimes twisted together and can look like a huge pollen pillar. Um, and they call them convoluted looking when they're up close. As you can sort of see here, they're weird and twisty. As for the pistil, it's usually three to five united carpels. And so that's when you want to look for conspicuous stigmas. So, sorry. So for example, in here, in the, in the drawing that you might see in a textbook, you get one pistil. But here I've drawn two and there should be a third one coming out. So in this case, that means that they're kind of united in here. But you can count, you can tell because they have one style and stamen, two, you get the idea, um, and three, sometimes more. And, sorry, and um, yeah, I think of them as looking kind of like inner ear parts, but you all might have a different description. The inferior, the, sorry, the ovary is inferior and also subtly chambered fruits with lots of seeds. So when you cut up members of this family um, on a cross section, then you can sort of see sometimes the different chambers. So are there any questions so far before we move on to the next bit? No questions so far? I'll give folks another moment if they want to write more of this down. Ooh, let's see here. What are some thoughts about why they have the bits in the separate flowers? Sorry about what? my spelling there. Oh, no, you're fine. You're totally fine, Jack. Um, let me think. That's a good question. Again, this is something I'd probably want to do a Y web about. I would wonder if part of it is to prevent them from self pollinating. If you have parts, the same parts in the same plant, then the plant will always have to, like, it's always going to be a balance about whether the plant will be viable if it self pollinates, meaning having less genetic diversity versus whether another plant pollinates it. And that's when it gets complicated. Sometimes you'll have them on the same plant, but they, but a different flower might mature at a different time. So one might mature, one type might mature earlier than the other one as a way of staggering it to make sure that like the bees or whoever else pollinates them will be able to get more genetic material so that they're not just pollinating from the same plant. At least that's how it seems to work out. So that's one idea, but there could be others too. I like that question. Any others, anybody else have any thoughts about that? No, not so far, okay. Before I move on to talking a little bit more about Monisha's houses, just a reminder to let the plant that's in front of you tell you. One of the most annoying things about botany is that there's always exceptions. So you might learn this and get an idea and then want to be really, really drilled into each of these details and then the plant will surprise you and stick its tongue out at you just to really make fun. Um, and so the idea is to get a feeling of this family by looking at the overall pattern, which is really hard to do. Um, and I like Anne's question about these birds and winds. And also um, Mary's question about stamens and stigmas, the same part. So the stamens are the male parts that make the pollen. Stigma is part of the pistil, which is the female part. Um, and the stigma is the part at, so if we have a pistil here, picture this as being sort of like a vase. Down here at the bottom of the vase would be the ovaries. And the neck of the vase would be the style. The very, very top of it would be the stigma. 
where the water or the pollen or whatever else comes inside. So I do apologize for that. I do try to not have too much vocabulary, but that is, um, yeah, those are some parts that kind of are distinct. Okay, sorry, here we go. Um, here is a note about plant houses. Um, there, we, what we call plant houses is really a way of saying, where do each kind of flower occur? Are they gonna be on the same plant or on different plants? So the term monoecious means one house, means that you have your male flowers and your female flowers on the same plant. Although what might be fun is to, is to sort of figure out where each of them are. They might be on different parts of the plant. And some, you might have the female plants higher up and the male plants lower down and others it might be reversed. Um, so that's what monoecious means. Then you might have others which are dioecious, meaning two houses. So you have a plant like perhaps the coyote brush where it's all male flowers. And you can sort of tell that because the flowers, they all will look the same. They'll all sort of have this dusty kind of yellow color, like somebody sprayed the plant with dried mustard. And then you have the female um, on the different flower. I mean, sorry, female flowers on a different plant where you might just see the fluff all over. So with this family, it tends to mostly be monoecious, but other times you will have a pattern where it is dioecious. And are monoecious flowers stigmatized? Oh, actually, I don't know what that exactly means. Could you, could you, I like your question. Could you elaborate, please? Oh, actually, I was just trying to make a bad pun. Oh, you mean like, are they made fun of? Yeah. I like it. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. It, okay, another thing. If anybody else has any plant puns, please put them in the chat. They make me happy. So yes, please do. That would make me very happy. <laughs> like it. Okay, here we go. Um, we'll go on. Does anybody have any questions so far um, before we go on to the next part? No? I think the next part might be which, um, which foods. So here's a question and I want people to, um, to call out. What foods do you think are in this family? Well, of course, all the squashes. Yep. All the squashes. Yeah. Who else? Cucumber. Yep, cucumber. Watermelon. Watermelon. Pumpkins. Pumpkins, yep. Who else? Do folks want to see? Yeah? Okay, here we go. As you all guessed, and as you all were correct about, all the squashes and all the melons are in this family, including Lufa. Oh. So as you can see, there's a lot of different varieties of these. Some of, of them I know are from either very similar or very same species, um, but then there's others that might surprise you. Like that, let's see here. Where is it? Cantaloupe over here and cucumber over here. If I'm recalling correctly, they're from the same genus. You might expect it instead that it would be cucumber and zucchini, this being um, cucurbita and this being cucumis, but it's not. Instead, it's sometimes it's a little bit weird. <laughs> so here are some of our examples. Now, one thing to really, really know about this family is that there are wild members who are toxic. There's this one that grows around here in California called sometimes called man root <clears throat> because of the really ginormous roots that grow underground um, and others call and other times called wild cucumber. Um, it's in the Mara genus and those you don't want to eat. There's others like that too, where you just, yeah, not good for you if you eat them. All right, are folks ready for the next part, which I think is everybody's favorite? Yeah? Okay, here we go. And again, um, don't be fooled. Even though it will say spot the amaranthaceae, that means nothing. Just pretend it says cucurbitaceae just because I couldn't figure out Zoom today. Here we go. It is time to play spot the cucurbitaceae. Here we go. And thank you, Anne, for being my amazing co-host. It looks to me like you did change the name, right? I did. Cougar 
Betasier, yeah. I guess it must have done last week. Okay, then. Well, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Did the poll load for everybody? Mm -hmm. Cool. Because I, I can't see it. From we, we only have one response so far, people. Come on. And again, remember. Here we go. Three, four, five. Not necessarily about having to get it right. So don't stress. This is just practice. It's all practice about learning how to see these differences in these plants. So don't worry about whether it's right or not. It's just learning. And I think you all know that you can move the pole out of the way if you need to. It's in if it's covering the pictures. Just drag it. We have 11 out of 15. Cool. 12, 13. And I don't think I can participate or you. So that might be everybody. I think you're right. Although we have 17 people total. Oh. Maybe it doesn't count us then. Maybe it doesn't. It's okay. We'll just give folks about 10 more seconds and then we'll find out our answer, okay? Sound good? Anybody else? And okay, who's ready to see the answer? Yeah, ready? It was, wait, did it show? Yeah, okay, wild cucumber. It was our first one. <sighs> Out of curiosity, what told people, for, for folks who might have guessed this one, what told people that this one was our cucurbitaceae friend? So um, uh, Amelia got this one. Uh, Amelia, come on, scoot over here with me. And uh, how, how did you know that A was, was a squash? Uh, and that the uh, um, that's the female flower. And how'd you know it was the female one? Because the ball underneath. Yep. Wow. Very good, Amelia. Really good. Good job. Yep. And I see, actually, Michelle agrees with you with the inferior ovary. Yep. Yeah, this one is a wild cucumber. Does anybody happen to know what this one is? This is a weird one that I actually didn't know until I looked it up the other day and then I was enamored. This is papaya, apparently. This is what a papaya flower looks like. <laughs> it's in a different family entirely. I think it's the Caracaceae. And then does anybody know this one? If you're in California, that one might look a little bit familiar. Oh, yep, yep, Jack knows it. This is a flannel bush. Another family that we're gonna be studying soon too but I'm not gonna give that away yet. All right, are folks ready for round two? Yep. Yeah. All right, here we go. Round two. How are we doing on, on guessing? We have 10 out of, oh, now it says 11 out of 11 or 12 out of 15, depends on where I look. <laughs> 13 out of 15, 14, dun, dun, dun. cool. And we have a very strong opinion here. It's 87% for one of the answers. Cool. I'm curious to know which one. Are you all ready to find out? Here we go. It was C. C for chayote. <laughs> Out of curiosity, what told people that C was the one? There's the fruit's right there, and I've eaten it many times. <laughs> yes, that does help that the fruit is right here. If, if the fruit were not, I would tell you honestly, though, if the fruit weren't there, I, there's no way I would have guessed that and I would have said A, but um, yeah, the fruit's right there. And in case you're curious, Caribbean name for it is Christophine. Christophine? For Ooh. Chilote, yeah. Could you write it in the chat for me? Because I'm going to I'm gonna write, it, wanna write it down later when I can. So Sure, so I'm not 100% sure about the spelling, but sure. 
So I this, didn't I didn't choose that one because the fruit was there and I thought that was too obvious. I know, I, I thought it was a trick. <laughs> Sometimes I like to do that kind of stuff just to mess with people and I apologize for that sort of, I think it's funny. Um, but yeah, I also see that people were mentioning the tendrils. So you're right about that. Now here's a question. What tells you that this one is not from Cucurbitaceae? Is that the ovary sticking up on the top? This one or? Uh, yeah, one? over on the left, the, is that a superior ovary? This one In right flower. here. This one right here. Just generally too many parts, like too many petals, too many, whatever those fluffy things are in the middle. Yep, way too many parts, way too many. Um, does anybody know what plant this is? And also not fused, yep. Like Jack said, this one here is a passion flower. So that's why I included it is because it will also be viney and tendrilly, and it will also have these lovely lobed leaves, but the flowers look completely different. And then this one here, does anybody know this one? This one can have a few different names. And this one also is tricky because it might look a bit fused from over here, but then there's this, there's this part here. Scarlet runner bean, good guess. Um, this is also known as a clock vine or in some circles a black eyed Susan, although that can kind of get mixed up with the flower that looks nothing like it. Um, so yeah, this is a clock vine or a Thunbergia if people are big fans of Greta Thunberg, Thunbergia from Acanthaceae. So that's what this one is. And that's why I included them is because they're all vines. <laughs> It'd be easy to only think about this one. I know I fall into that sometimes. Are folks ready for round three, the final round? All right, and remember, this is all just practice. Round three. So we've got six out of 15, seven, eight, nine. We have some strong opinions on this one too. 13, 14, and it's unanimous. Really? Yeah. Oh, all right then, are we ready Either to see? Either you fooled all of us or we're all just right on. I thinking it's gonna be the latter. Are y'all ready? One, two, C. <laughs> Did people get it? Was that what people thought? Yeah, hundred percent. Cool. Oh, and to answer your question, Michelle, um, it's okay. I pronounce it cucurbitaceae because last time I taught um, the series, I tried to sound like the professional botanist who would probably say cucurbitaceae, but I just, I guess I just sound like an amateur. <laughs> I have to say cucurbitaceae because it's just how I was taught it by Marley. So yeah, um, you can pretty much say it however you like. Latin is kind of dead anyways. So as long as people sort of know what you're talking about, I think I feel like don't worry too much about pronunciation. But yeah, um, folks, y'all are right. Uh, this It was indeed C. So what told people that this was the one? Like the brainy brainy look of the center part. <laughs> I love, like yeah. Cerebral. <laughs> also, I was wondering often like the hairy vines, like, you know how cucumber vines will stab you. I wonder if vines in this family are all hairy or prickly. I was wondering that too. I think of them as being that way. Um, although when I, I was double checking my sources a few times in the botany book just to see, but um, nobody else mentioned that fuzziness was a characteristic, even though I kind of thought it was. Um, yeah. But I would say fuzzy is a good characteristics. And, and yeah, squash looking leaves. I think that's a great one. Um, I like the way that you described this as kind of being brain looking. Any, it, what else told people that it was this one and not the others? Yep, convoluted, very convoluted. Why not this one? Uh, the petals are separate. Yep, yep, petals can be a bit more separate. What else? Ah, um, Loretta, are you talking about A? 
because an egg, egg does contain both female and male parts. Right in here is the female part and then the male parts all surrounding it. Um, it does look like the Hawaiian flower for good reason, um, because it is, it is a hibiscus. It is indeed a hibiscus. Um, so, so you were right. And yep, this one, yep, they are pretty ornamental. This one is edible. So folks are right that this is nasturtium. Um, and then this one here, as mentioned, is watermelon. Just our last little bit of recapping. Oh, even mm -hmm. before you, oh, sorry, yeah. this is Deborah. Before you recap, just an interesting little thing. If people would like to grow a, a chayote, um, just get a pot and put uh, uh, the, the fruit in the soil with just the tip showing, or probably a third of it and put it kind of at a 45 degree angle. It's a it's an old preschool teacher um, activity. So lots of fun. That and you'll get a huge plant. That is really cool, Deborah. And now that's something I want to do now. I think that'd be really fun. So thank you. And so, um, so yeah, just to go over our- well, Just a quick question. With that planting the chayote like that, which end goes up? The I stem end that, or the flower end? I think that question's to you, Deborah. Sorry? Muted. Sorry, I muted myself. The uh, stem end. I, I mean, I mean, the stem end goes down and the, um, the large end goes up. So, yes. Good to know. Am I, is, am I saying it backwards? I think I'm saying it right. Yeah. That's cool. I've never done it before. So I'm learning from you. I think that's cool. I'm going to try it. Thank you. So just to quick recap of our characteristics, we have vining plants with tendrils, a lot of times to help them climb up things. We have lobed and or palmate leaves, um, not pinnate and not compound. Sing, um, simple and single leaves. We have unisex flowers, meaning one of each kind, um, only sepals or only, sorry, not only sepals, um, <laughs> only stamens or only pistils, but not both in the same flower. Usually monoecious plants, which means that they'll both, which means both kinds of flowers will be found on the same plant instead of separate ones. Um, usually five sepals, although sometimes zero. Um, Petals usually fuse together at some point into a corolla, kind of funnel-shaped corolla. We have our twisty stamens and we have our pistils that kind of unite into carpels with an inferior ovary. And all that pretty much means is that there's more than one of these that unite together. That's what carpels pretty much means, um, is that there's individual little bits that unite. Um, and if you were to look, you might see that they have very subtle, subtle chambers, not with any hard and fast divisions, but still with divisions that you can see if you were to cut them sideways and take a close look at them, which I hope people will do for their dinners. And as always, let the plant that's in front of you tell you. And that is it for tonight. So thank you. Thank you very much. Does thank anybody you. Thank you. Does, does anybody, oh, before I forget, I want to say a huge thank you to Anne for being the best co-host ever. So thank you, Anne. <laughs> You're very welcome. Another great class, Uvea. Thank you so much. I always learn a ton from you and it's always fun. So happy to be here. Thank you. And I always learn a lot from you all in your questions because this is my first time teaching a lot of this stuff. So you all always make me learn more stuff that I didn't know before. So thank you. Does anybody have any questions or things they want to share or fun experiences with cucurbits in your own life? Oh, Jack. I, I had a, a fun um, squashy experience um, where, um, do, do you want to see me discovering uh, moniciousness? Yes. Um, on, on, on a page of a journal? Um, where, th where I like, I think I know what's going on and then realize I have no idea what's going on and then realize, oh, now I understand. Um, but I'm gonna share screen or this thing. Um, 
here is the squash adventure. Um, so it starts way back here. And um, so I uh, planted these squash in my backyard. And so there are these cool flowers. And so I decided to do a drawing of what's inside it. And so, so I look and I see this one and I go like, oh, cool. And then there are these ones. And so what I thought was that these turn into these. So if you look at this, so here's an enlargement of this. Starts, it starts as a central stalk, then turns into this. But the more I looked at this, I more it just wasn't matching. So then I added in this, or does it? Dun, dun, dun. So that made me want to come back another time and take a closer look. So I came back another time. And let's see what happened then. Because I went crazy on these little squashy friends. So I looked around a whole bunch of them. And then kind of got in there and just geeked out hard on the, 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 the stigma and the structure. So there's an enlargement of the stigma. And then here's a cross section of the stigma structure. There's this cool little moat that was around it. And I, uh, and so I, I thought that was really neat. Um, and then there are these, I think those might have been nectaries in that inside that moat. I'm not sure. But um, then Wild Wonder happened and it was great. And let's see, I'm going to go for this one more little sort of squash deep dive. And now I'm kind of on, I'm hip to the fact that we've got these female flowers. And um, th then, so this is another kind of enlargement of that structure. This one didn't get the memo on having three and it had four little pads out there. And then here's a close up of that little cool moat zone. But there are such fun things for drawing and diagramming. I really encourage people to, to geek out with a squash flower because there's just, it's, you can do a deep dive and have a ton of fun. Thank you so much. Just seeing, just seeing your geeking out over it makes me want to go find them. I want to like go find them and, and yeah, have fun in the garden. I love, I love your way of di diagramming them too, where, um, where it, where you can, you can both show, hello. I see a friend in the background. Hello. <laughs> oh, I see. She's gone. Hiding, hiding very well. Um, but I like the way that you diagram it so that you can both see the fruit emerging, but then also see what's happening inside of that flower um, that would be on the, that would be on the, oh, hello again. Um, yeah. Yeah, this, I love this, where you have um, the part where you have the fruit a bit more to you. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Where you have the fruit here and then over here you have the flower and but you still have sort of the outline of where the petals would be so that you can see everything that's happening inside of this flower. Oh, Just, can, can I ask you a, a, a question? I, so here's, here's a structure question. So inside there's this little moat and it's got the stigma sticking up, but on the outside of the moat, were these wiggly, bumpy, lumpy tissue things that I could pull out into this sort of long, flexible string, and then I'd let go and it kind of go blurp back into this little gnarly ball. Oh. And there were two of those. And so it was on a little pad and had no idea structurally. And these were not on all of the squash, but some of them had these little thingamahoosers. And were they all in similar gendered um, flowers when you would see them or were they kind of just- In, in the female flower. In the female flower, but, but not every female flower. Not every one. Like this one back here. Um, this one didn't have them. Ooh. Interesting. 
And this one had three. And then this one here has four, and it's got these little bonus goo hickeys. <laughs> Interesting. Isn't that weird? That's so weird. Yeah, I had no idea what those. So they were my my little mystery wiggly things. I love it. Oh, that that look that looks like it'll be fun to investigate. Mm -hmm. Are they mm -hmm. the same kind of plants? Are they all? Are they yeah, all same 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 plants? Same. They were crookneck squash. How weird. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that's that's just there's something going on there, and I don't know what it is. And uh, there you go. That makes me really happy. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Okay, now I have something new I'm going to be investigating this spring if I ever get in proximity to squash flowers. I'm not lucky. Does anybody else have a question for you, Ivea? Um, so I grow a lot of squash and pumpkins, and I kind of toss things, everything into the compost at the end of the season. And then sometimes things grow out of the compost, and I'm not sure what they are. And I think, oh, should I eat that or not? And so one year I ate some that you know, I know it came from what I put in the compost, but it gave me a pretty bad stomach ache. <laughs> and um, somebody told me that squash are, and I can't think of the word, it's like, the word is like infidelity. It's like they reproduce not faithfully. Uh, what's the word that I can't think of? Anyway, uh, Like, so you're not gonna get a true, like what you buy from the nursery is bred to be a certain thing. But if you just let it reproduce out in the garden year after year, it might cross pollinate with something else or morph into something else that maybe you don't wanna eat. Is there an explanation for that? I don't know what the explanation is, but what I was told was that they don't exactly breed true. And that if you wanted to have it so that you get a certain one, you have to wait till just when the female plant, like flower is opening up. Um, you wait until, um, oh, good to see you, Celia. Um, you wait um, until just that point, you have the pollen in mind that you want, and then you have to pollinate it yourself and then tape the flower shut. Oh, okay, yeah. If you want to be able to get- It doesn't happen in my compost pile. Yeah. <laughs> so, possibly hybrid. Yeah, exactly. Fruit trees work that same way too. Um, good to see you, Alex. Um, you have to be able to, like a lot of times when you have something from a Granny Smith, it doesn't come from a whole bunch of different kinds of Granny Smiths necessarily. It will usually come from just a few trees or maybe one tree in the world because they have to take it from the exact same one so that they get the true one. And I don't know all of the gene, like all of the genealogy about how that works, but I mean, I'm guessing diversity purposes, why you won't get an exact replica of it is that then you have diversity. Um, so yeah, there's, yeah, you can't just, so yeah. Yeah, thanks. And like you said, do you get that stomach ache? But I'm sorry, I don't have more answers about that because that is a good question. Does anybody else have any thoughts or questions before we go for tonight? And again, thank you all for bearing with me on this. A lot of the stuff, um, I'm teaching it, but for the first time. And so just by doing this with you all, I'm learning so much more than I would have otherwise. So thank you all very much for being part of my education on this too. And it's really good to see all of you. So I'll see you all next time. Take care.